My name is Tess Hoss. I'm the head of market research at Health Excel. And I'm joined today by Marina and Eugene Borkovic of Your Coach, who will spend the next hour with us and help us really demystify health coaching for the audience. Over the next minute, over the next 60 minutes or so, Marina and Eugene will dig into the science of health coaching and why health coaches are so important at this moment in time, especially in the context of digital health. They'll dissect the macro tailwinds driving momentum in this space, as well as the broader trends and opportunities in digital health coaching. So for the audience, we will have some time for Q&A at the end. So please use the Q&A or chat function for all of your questions. But before we get stuck into the discussions, Marina and Eugene, I think you know, it's really time that you introduce yourselves and maybe tell the audience a little bit about the mission of your coach. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, so Eugene Borovic, I am co-founder and COO of Your Coach Health. Um, I've spent the last 20 years in healthcare, health tech uh, from as I kind of joke around that I'm either a recovering executive or recovering entrepreneur. So I've been recovering from being an executive in a big pharma. Uh, my history dates all the way back to pharmacy benefit management, consulting, my own startups in between. Um, and then I joined uh, Marina in January of 2020. Um, and, and as I joke around also, she was always my boss. Now it's official. So um, that's that me in a, a nutshell. Is that a joke? Oh, I thought it was. Mm, all right, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll stick that it's not a joke. <laughs> Hi, my name is Marina Borakovic, and I'm the founder and CEO of Your Coach. Um, I started out, my background started out as a developer many, many moons ago. I would not hire me as a developer right now. So just saying that, um, unless you have a mainframe laying around somewhere, then I'm your girl. Um, but uh, fast forward, we moved to Amsterdam about 11 years ago as expats for two years. And while in Amsterdam at the age of 37, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And um, after the doctors were done working their miracle, which was my life, you know, I went through chemotherapy and mastectomy and radiation and multiple reconstructive surgeries and complications. I mean, you name it, I've had it, uh, but after all was said and done, and I was supposed to just go my way and live my happy life, I was more broken than ever. Um, discovered health coaching just by hacking away at myself, at my body, realizing what it is that I need holistically. Um, became a health coach, started practicing with a few clients, which, was, which I thought that was gonna be my journey at that point, but, um, that was not the case. Um, Eugene didn't think that I could practice with my clients with pen and paper. So he kind of gently nudged me to create a platform, which I did. So created a platform for me to use with my own clients and some of the, um, my, my cohort from the coaching school, they started using it as well. And fast forward to today, about two and a half years later, we have over 2,300 coaches on the platform. So what your coach is, um, we are the operating system for behavior change powered by health coaches. At the heart of what we do is still this practice management platform for health and wellness coaches, where they come in, they bring their own clients, they do everything from um, onboarding the clients to setting goals and tasks and to do's, um, having video sessions and chat sessions, um, you notes know after, um, after co coaching sessions. Um, and what that gives us, we have a lot of information of how great these coaches are in real world and what they do with their clients and their client outcomes. So algorithmically, uh, we check that and we match them with our clients who are companies looking to surround their product or service offering with health coaching. And we have APIs and widgets that we plug in. So it's, um, it's a very um, embedded experience. So that's in a nutshell about us and your coach and all of that. Great. Um, well, thank you both so much. Um, what, what a founding story. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, but I guess um, just maybe to kickstart, um, you know, and, and really level set, I think you had prepared a short presentation. So maybe we'll discuss that for the next, you know, 10 minutes or so, uh, and then really get stuck into um, a little bit of a, a, an interview. Perfect. Sounds good. And for the audience, don't be shy. Keep those questions moving. We'll try to address as many as we can. So please. Yeah, off. just to kick it off. So like I mentioned, we are the operating system for behavior change powered by health coaches. And um, our mission from day one was by the year 2030 for the projected eight and a half billion population to have access to health coaching. And uh, you know, this has been our mission before uh, 20, so in it 19 and 2019, when the company first, the, the idea of the company got started, 2030 seemed like 
a ways away. And we were just talking about it this the other day. And, you know, it's only eight years away. So we have our work cut out for us. We sure do. <laughs> um, health coaching has been getting a lot of buzz lately. And health coach, they want a health coach, but not really sure about what that is. Uh, but there has been a lot of um, health coaching in the news anywhere from the New York Times to Wall Street Journal. And this has been some really, really great reporting about the outcomes of um, health coaching. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, I mean, I think part of that, and we've, we've seen a lot of these articles in the last two years as the pandemic really exposed, you know, inequalities to access to care, um, you know, taking care of our whole, you know, holistically our bodies. Um, and so I think that really brought us forward as a health coaching industry in the last, you know, two, two plus years through the pandemic as well. What is the health coach question of the day? So this is our definition of a health coach, and that is a trusted partner and mentor who empowers individuals to both identify and achieve their goals as they relate to health and wellness and mindset. And a health coach encourages and supports that client every step of the way uh, with science-backed behavior-driven lifestyle modification tools. And I know you have a favorite. Uh, I was going to jump right in. You, you can tell <laughs> in my face. Um, so, you know, as a CEO of a coaching company, I, I had to kind of experience what it really is. So I took a very abbreviated nine-week course in health coaching. Don't ask me to health coach uh, ever. But, you know, I kind of summarized after those nine weeks to the class of 47 students that, well, basically like non-clinical psychotherapy, right? Um, and again, just not to repeat it, but it's somebody who listens well. Uh, it's somebody who helps you understand, set, and achieve your goals. And health coaching can help clients, and we don't necessarily call them patients. I mean, it could be a patient, but it's also clients anywhere from disease management, disease reversal, prevention, and also to optimize performance because we all want to be better versions of ourselves. Why a health coach? I mean, there's so many different professions to choose from. Um, and while a doctor only has a few minutes to spend with you, and that's not because they don't want to spend more time, they're just not able to spend any more time. A health coach literally is trained to spend from half an hour to an hour session, just truly listening and understanding what your motivations are. It's more cost effective. It's about building a strong relationship. And health coaches are trained in science-backed techniques. It's not, it's, it's not a voodoo science. It's a real science. Yeah, and I won't go through all of this. We'll we'll get into deeper discussions, and I'll just want to point everybody's eyes on the bottom left. Um, you know, countless clinical studies has confirmed the effectiveness of health coaching, and what um, you know the between the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaching um, contracted a compendium of studies, over two hundred studies, and they're refreshing this now. Um, and we sort of took a summary of a summary. Just again, I don't expect anybody to read this. Uh, we can share the slides after the webinar as well with the, with the Health Excel com community. Um, if for those who are interested, the link is on the bottom. Again, we'll, we'll share this, but as you can see, you know, quite a broad, and we just picked you know, six, uh, but you know, heart disease, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and there are certain outcomes um, that we're seeing very positively in it. Um, you know, oncology specifically, if you wanna to maybe touch on, um, yeah. Yeah, we're going to be doing actually um, in Q3 of this year, we're going to be doing a study on effects of health coaching on stage four breast cancer patients. So, yeah, yeah. we are looking close, close to our hearts. Very so. much so. We'll breeze right through this, but, um, you know, reimbursements um, are coming. Um, education, we now, I think when we started, we had probably less than 60 school slash programs. Yeah, over 100. Yeah, we, we did our first. Um, health coaching report when we first started in 2020. And now we're working on version two of this report and we're talking to so many more schools. There's so much more information. And this ranges from certification programs to undergraduate and graduate programs. So we've definitely come a long way even in the past two years. And then again, just like with anything else, and I know many of you guys are in digital therapeutics area as well, that listening in, you know, it needed evidence for it to start kind of taking off while well, the evidence, you know, is here, more is coming, right? Um, and, you know, again, we'll sort of dive into some deeper discussions on that. You know, in short, this is projected to be just in a few years now, almost a nine billion, you know, as a health coaching market. And we do see health coaching, you know, typically healthcare was healthcare, wellness was wellness. 
Um, I think, you know, the, the combination of the pandemic, um, you know, given rise to the health coaching as an industry, we also see this as a huge bridge, you know, this particular profession as a bridge between wellness and healthcare. Um, so that's, you know, a little bit of that. And, you know, in a summary, while especially focused in the US uh, system, um, three and a half trillion, you know, we, it can be reduced via health coaching. And hence, we're here to try to demystify this in this webinar. Wow, we just breathed right through that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, was, that was not even close to, to five minutes, but really clear. Um, thank you both so much for kind of that, that level of setting. I think you explained the concept really well, but I guess my question to you is, you know, why is it so important to demystify health coaching in general, but maybe more so, you know, particularly at this point in time, you know, why, why are we having this session? Because if it's so effective, why is it still so misunderstood? If I tell you how many times a day we have people asking us, is health coach a personal trainer? Um, is health coach there to nudge me along? It's so misunderstood what this profession actually is and health coaches are so much more than that. While a health coach could be a personal trainer, not necessarily. While they could have other certifications like a registered dietitian or a nurse or a physical therapist, absolutely. But health coaches also stand on their own. So there's so much to what they can do to help clients achieve their health and wellness goals. And that's why we're having these conversations to demystify and to shed light on what health coaches do. They're more than nudgers, right? They're more than somebody to tell you to do something or to just stand over you and to make sure that you did that. It's about intrinsic motivation and health coaches are really, really great at helping their clients uncover that. And, you know, and I think just to add a little bit on this, you know, as the healthcare system has been under pressure for many years, more so in the last few years, and even less time being spent in the doctor's office, right? Um, and, and, now, and I'm including telemedicine as the doctor's office, the virtual one. Um, I think, you know, nurses are, you know, everything from resigning to leaving the profession, right? And we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk more around kind of what, what the coaching is. Um, this is a, an amazing talented workforce that's been there. You know, the industry has been there for 20 plus years. And only since the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaching been set up in 2012, they've been meticulously also moving a lot of this forward as far as what is the job to be done by a coach, um, you know, the reimbursement we talked about. And so setting that scope of practice, what a yeah. health coach can and cannot do. You know, people are so, especially since the pandemic, people are so desperate for help. We get requests all the time from clients, even though we're not direct to consumer, we get requests all the time for people wanting to help. And these requests range from mental, mental health to oncology questions, right? And that's not something that a health coach is equipped to handle. But if this request falls into the wrong hands, there's a lot of responsibility here. So it is our job, we feel, to educate what a health coach is and for the public to know what they can and cannot come to a coach with. Nice. Um... Yeah, that, that, that makes perfect sense and um, interesting to kind of see like the, the types the types of question you're getting and, and the demand that you're seeing. But I guess maybe for the, you know, for our audience, um, because, you know, at Excel, we're very focused on digital health. So if I could bring the conversation a little bit more to the digital health realm. So where does health coaching come into play in digital health? What is the scope of practice for coaches uh, within that space? And I know in your presentation, you already covered this, you know, quite well in terms of therapeutic areas. But what are some of the different use cases for digital health coaching that you're really seeing demand for? Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave the scope of practice as I only took nine weeks to, to <laughs> Marina, but I'll, I'll, I'll touch on um, kind of what, where we're seeing, you know, everything from inbound um, requests, et cetera. You know, if, if you break down and I know digital health is a broader, broader term. Um, we're seeing use cases. Uh, so, and, and first of all, if you just go indeed.com today and search for health coach in US, there's like 11,000 plus jobs open, right? So, and, um, and those are our potential clients as well uh, on the B2B side. But what we're seeing is use cases around primary care. Um, we're seeing use cases in more broadly termed digital health companies. We're exploring cases in re remote patient monitoring, right? And, you know, we can get deeper into what we're seeing exactly within those. We're seeing cases, you know, yes, mental health. As a matter of fact, just a shout out to Nikhil out of pocket, right? Yesterday uh, was perfect placement uh, in a way for our, our webinar today as health coaching is one of the 
potential solutions for our mental health crisis as a society, right? Again, non-clinical, but preventative. Um, we, patient support patient programs. Patient support programs. Care clinic. communities, right? It just, the list goes on and on. Yeah, you know, clinical trials. So happy to kind of dive in deeper into any one of them, um, you know, maybe address some farmer use cases. Uh, I know well, lots of people, but, you know, we'll, we'll let you drive. Which, which one we, we can dive in? Well, yeah, my, my next question was going to be, I think, you know, that if we could maybe focus in on the farmer use case, I think that would be particularly interesting maybe for um, the audience today. So I suppose to what extent is industry, um, you know, pharma in this case, then tapping into this opportunity, if you could maybe give us kind of some examples that you're seeing some, you know, examples or some conversations you've been having. Yeah, so believe it or not, and um, we don't have that um, handy today, but certainly can follow up. Um, there's been a number of clinical trials for certain products that actually included health coaching um, as well. But those are very far and few in between. Um, when we first got the first couple of inbounds, we, you know, the first one was a little bit of a fluke, and we thought maybe it's just my sort of my background in pharma. Um, and then more started coming in. Um, you know, there's lots of challenges to solve, but if you think about just from a clinical trial perspective, right, um, it's very costly uh, to attract uh, individuals to the clinical trial. And then, of course, adhere to the clinical trial. And then many people also forget about, you know, the caregivers in that clinical trial. So we've had a number of use cases, um, you know, coming in from that. As a young company, we are looking for, you know, some brave people um, that we can really, you know, kind of trial this and figure out all the ins and outs. You know, to give an example of some challenges that we see in the clinical trial is, you um, you know, is a health coach considered an intervention? How does a health coach work with a PI? So there's many, many questions that we need to be answered and we would need to do, you know, cohort um, as well. So that's just one. So let's talk clinical trial. In a similar fashion, patient support programs, right? Um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, depends on which side of the fence you look at it, patient support programs are a cost of doing business for pharma. Um, and, you know, in specialty drugs, especially, right, uh, again, the, the value of caregivers are there. And so we've actually had some inbound from a caregiver perspective. Um, you could, at least in U.S., have a patient experience label. So if you think about that going through the clinical trial, but that also presents challenges on that as well from, a, you know, continuous support. So that's the patient support. Um, you know, if we think about, you know, pseudo tied to pharma, but let's, that, let's look at even some of the hospital discharges and remote patient monitoring use cases, same thing, we're exploring that. You know, I think as a industry, we've been so looking inside on what do we need the patient to do, and therefore you're not adhering to your drug, you're not adhering to wearing your device, and I'm going to use a random example if somebody, God forbid, had a stroke, right? And, you know, yes, there is remote patient monitoring. And for that person, the goal is not to wear the device or take the drug. The goal is might be as simple as, to all of us, walk two blocks, right? And so, you know, um, leveraging this amazing workforce that can understand and try to extract those intrinsic motivations, and set goals, you're reversing that discussion in remote patient monitoring, completely flipping it on its head, right, versus staying adherent. So I'll, pa I'll pause here. Um, those are just some of the things that we've seen inbound. Um, yeah, no, that's, um, that's great. And I suppose it goes way beyond, you know, the use cases that I'm sure many people would have actually, you know, considered kind of right, right off the, the bat. So what specifically then is your coach doing in order to enable coaches to work across, you know, what's really a multitude of use, of use cases? How, how do you handle that? And is it a case actually that coaches kind of tend to just work, you know, in one particular use case, or are you seeing that they actually, you know, cross into different use cases quite a bit? Yeah, we identify coaches based on what, they, what they're really good at, based on what kind of client they can connect with. Because coaching, it's not just a transactional relationship. It's, um, it's a sticky relationship, right? They, it's, uh, they, they need to work together. It's a relationship building. They need to work together for anywhere from six, eight, 12 weeks. So we have... Or longer, as we, or as longer, you always say, exactly. we have and flow we with and different flow challenges through it. It's, it's a relationship. Yeah. So we just filed some patents for algorithms, which identify which coaches work best with which clients. 
and we match them. And we also augment coaches on a platform. So when they practice, they get to, we help them with maybe using more of a certain type of questions or telling them what they should be doing better or maybe telling them what they should be doing less of. Mm -hmm. So that is some of the things that we're doing. And then we match them ultimately with, uh, with, with our clients. But, you know, and, and I think this will resonate throughout this conversation. You know, a health and wellness coach is a health and wellness coach. The understanding of the underlying disease is absolutely important, but we got to all remember that, you know, pure health and wellness coaching is a non-clinical service. And so again, you know, whether you take a metabolic disease or heart health, um, you know, again, a very specific disease knowledge is important. And we are tracking across 16 yeah. categories. At this 16 point. categories, yeah. but even within those categories, there's new specialties of coaches. And while a coach can coach somebody with diabetes or with gut health issues or uh, some stress and anxiety, it's all about making that connection. Mm -hmm. So it's making sure that a coach can connect to a client at that level. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's nice to kind of see that, that level of personalization also being brought into this service. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that the addressable market is really quite significant. I think you mentioned around 9 billion US dollars or so. So how much of this market would you say is currently being served? And over the short term, what will really drive growth in this market? Yeah, so I think the latest numbers from last year, uh, it's about 7.2 billion uh, and projected to be 8.8 .8, um, within, you know, by, by 2025. Um, you know, I think, again, if you get below the surface, I think a lot of the health coaching jobs out there, as Marina sort of pinpointed, um, are looked at as nudgers or reminders that are human beings. Um, so that's kind of just one, one, one quick premise. I think, you know, from the driving perspective, um, you know, there's, as we talked about, there's reimbursements, there's evidence, um, you know, there's the time that we've spent, um, you know, in the doctor's office and outside. I don't know if you want to add anything else to this, but. No, I yeah. think, yeah, I think, I think you covered it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, nice. And, and what are you doing then to, to drive growth in this market? Yeah, so we, you know, we, I guess, you know, uh, as, as Marina pointed out, right, there was the practice management solution, um, you know, we are, what we're seeing also is, you know, with this great reshuffling, uh, you know, people are leaving their jobs, um, you know, the, the gig economy of health coaches is absolutely growing. We won't mention any names uh, on uh, as far as the company names, but there was a significant layoff uh, in one of the health coaching companies. Um, you know, I think fi about 500 coaches, um, and many of them are now on our platform, you know, kind of rediscovering what, you know, real health coaching is, um, as well as, you know, really becoming entrepreneurs to a certain extent, right? So we're given that freedom of, of opportunities. But we also don't just leave them hanging. The coaches that come to the platform, I mean, sometimes there's coaches on there now that we started the relationship with when they were just looking to identify which coach and school to go to. So it's, it's, it's a long game for us. And those that are on the platform, we constantly have workshops from actual coaching techniques to how to help them level up their business. Not, not everybody is going to want to work through us. Not everybody is going to want to practice on their own. Some coaches are looking for those jobs. But we look at this, how can we help make happy and healthy humans? How many coaches can we help who they, that they can help their clients in turn? So that is that is our end game. However, we get to it. Yeah, and the way you know, kind of in addition, right? Uh, the way and Marina alluded to this in the beginning. You know, part of that is they practice as many hours as they want with their own clients. Um, you know, the ones that we kind of knock on the virtual door for additional opportunities once it becomes available to them. Um, we offer them opportunities with our clients, right? And part of that is also helping them understand the specific protocols. So just to give you an example, uh, we're launching this summer uh, with a mental health uh, self-paced digital therapeutic company where we're gonna be powering up all of the health coaching. Uh, you know, the, the team at that company kind of structured all the protocols initially. And our responsibility as well is a obviously to to help these coaches get additional work and, and be self-sufficient from an entrepreneur perspective, but be also prepare them on the protocols of our B2B clients. Um, and so there, there is a process um, that, that we go through for that. 
And so it's, it's anywhere from actual coaching protocols to being part of that company's DNA, because that's the only way that this is going to work. If these coaches are embedded, if they believe in what they're doing, if they understand what the population that they're serving. Nice. Um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, the benefits of adding that particular human service layer to digital therapies. And I'm sure, again, the audience would be quite interested to kind of see how, how well this applies to digital therapeutics. So when we're talking about, obviously, that service layer for digital therapeutics, rather than the digital therapeutic where the software is the active, where the software is the active ingredient, what's the demand you're seeing for this additional service layer? Yeah, so uh, as you know, you, we do separate in the health Excel world and others, you know, PDT is, as I think Brian Dolan coined it, right, in a prescription digital therapeutic versus non-prescription, right? So I, I think we're definitely seeing much more in the non-prescription digital therapeutic space. Um, you know, as you can imagine, the upstream clients are either, you know, direct to consumer, large employers, or health plans, where while the evidence for that digital therapeutic is absolutely required. It doesn't need the FDA approval. And therefore, you know, I think we're seeing on a spectrum of things. Um, yes, self-paced tools are there and many individuals do have intrinsic motivation to use them and help themselves and kind of the self-help. But in many cases, and if you actually, um, you know, our logo is a Hito, which is a Japanese kanji for a human being. And we all need a person to lean on is, is the premise, right? And, and so we are seeing you know, quite a lot of inbound from the non-prescription, um, some early discussion on the prescription digital therapeutic, but to your point, you know, as the prescription digital therapeutics are going through clinical trials as well, that needs to be taken into consideration um, as well. And we have not been tapped for any potential clinical trials with or without health coaches to date. Okay. Happy to explore, however, whoever's <laughs> listening. So, um, and could you maybe also elaborate a little bit on the specific instances where a service layer is actually beneficial or potentially even required? Yeah. Um, so I think a couple of things, right? Um, a uh, and Marina always says this. You know, human human eye is still better than AI, right? Um, and I think on the progression, depending what that particular digital therapeutic and the therapeutic area covers and touches, um, you know, um, not not to pinpoint the DTX podcast that I host, but I I will. <laughs> um, last season's um, question was always, you know, do you see DTX becoming kind of the digital health of virtual care 2.0, right? where the services are embedded. At the end of the day, um, you know, if we fast forward, it will be a combination of services slash devices, software or not, right? Um, and so we're seeing some progressive digital therapeutic companies that are saying, well, you know, service layer is needed. Others just saying, well, you know, we focus where we focus best um, and let others like your coach kind of operate under, you know, as powering that up. But again, in a non-prescription world, many of the DTX companies are being asked for that additional service layer, um, you know, to route the, the employees, the talent, you know, the members, et cetera. It always works better together, yeah. right? Yeah. Nice. It's digital and human eye. Okay. Um, very good podcast, by the way. So you, you should give it a shout out. Um, yeah, you yeah just, get... you know, why not? Take, take the opportunity. Um, that's great. And can coaches solve for some of these kind of, you know, um, quite well-known adoption barriers, say a digital therapeutics needs orientation or some kind of onboarding, um, you know, show patients how to use it. Are there specific, or digital therapeutics, sorry, where there are specific do's and don'ts, um, you know, where there's a particular dosing regimen. What are health coaches um, kind of doing in this respect and do they have a place here? So, they can, but that's not really what a health coach's job is. Mm -hmm. I would say that's more of a job of a navigator uh, to help with support and, um, but a job of a health coach is truly to establish that connection and to help them find and set their own health and wellness goals. So mm -hmm. while it's something that if you hire internally and you have your own staff, that's probably something you would ask them to do. That's not something that we would prefer our coaches to, to, to practice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and interesting enough, some of the initial inbounds that as we were sort of toying with, um, you know, that kind of Intel insight for health coaching as we were, you know, pivoting into that model, 
um, some of the initial use cases were exactly what you said, that word adherence, right? Um, because there is a DTX or there is a tool or there is a service that, well, that upstream patient consumer is not adherent to. And again, let's face it, many of those companies are leveraging coaches to do a lot of that work. But the ones that have been doing that are now starting to separate those roles, realizing the true value of health coaching. So the ones that have been doing this for many years now, and where the kind of the more progressive leveraging health coaches for what they truly good at, are now starting to split those roles into kind of navigators and health coaches tied closer to clinical staff if it's a clinical company, right? So. Now, every time we get an inbound and we start diving a little bit deeper, we always say, what do you think the health coach does? Because that just tells us so much right off the bat who it is that they're looking for. And we're never going to pretend if they are looking for a navigator, we'll just tell them that this is not something that we do. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing clarity on that. I suppose they are. They are very different roles. Um, and again, you've already touched on some of this earlier, but will adding the service layer lead to easier reimbursement and or additional revenue for digital therapies um, and products. And maybe if you could comment on this data of reimbursement, that would be nice as well. So reimbursements are still in category three, which means that they're being tested. Um, it's probably gonna be another 24 to 36 months until they are approved and they, they are gonna be able to get billed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll cover uh, one, 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 a couple of other things. Um, so just from a historical perspective, um, you know, the national board has been on the scene since 2012, um, you know, around 2019, um, they actually working with the American Medical Association established those three CPT codes. It's an initial onboarding session. It's the ongoing session. That's one-on-one. -on -one, and there's a third code for a uh, group session as well. Uh, those are, again, as Marina pointed out, test codes. They've been, quote unquote, deployed. In 2021, uh, I believe in April, there was now a taxonomy code issued for health and wellness coaches, um, which actually is pretty amazing because now you can almost like in many EMRs, et cetera, you can pull down and say health coach, and that has its own taxonomy code. And um, there's about a thousand coaches or so uh, in US that have their national provider index number. Um, already. Um, this year, um, early, I don't remember the date, uh, but the national board together with health and well, uh, together with the AMA, uh, sorry, together with the UC San Diego kicked off the real world data collection. Now that those CPT codes have been tested in the VA, I think for the ones that are listening in, know the journey from the, for these codes to go uh, from test codes to actual reimbursement codes. You know, there's been some precedents where, you know, Headspace Health, Ginger, Cigna actually covers, you know, very specific set of, you know, mental health preventative coaching. Uh, but broadly speaking, we still got a few years to go. Um, as far as your, your first part of the question was around business models, and I kind of look at this, and, and I just saw somebody actually ask Joseph on business models, so that touches on this. Um, you know, Upstream, some companies are looking at this as, a, again, a cost of doing business, right, uh, because of lack of staff, you know, both nursing, doctors, specialists, etc. Um, you know, other companies are looking at this as a potential additional revenue stream that's probably on the, I'll say, a little bit more outskirts of true healthcare. So if you can think of a direct-to-consumer health and care company could offer, offer health coaching, um, you know, we're, you know, we're starting to work with and exploring all of those use cases. Um, you know, if you think about VBC value-based care, right, where, you know, yes, that value and that outcome actually matters. And again, what Marina alluded to earlier, you know, much more cost, cost efficient workforce that's still talented, pretty well trained. So from that business model, in short, you know, cost of doing business in some cases, others are looking at this as a revenue stream. For us, it's all a revenue stream and an <laughs> outcome, right? Um, but that's, that's, you know, we'll pause here. Yeah, um, yeah, this kind of brings me nicely to my next question. You did touch on some of that, uh, on, some, on some of the, the question already, but I suppose when we sort of read into digital health coaching, there's always that question around, you know, scalability, how scalable is it and how does it kind of, especially in comparison, I suppose, to a purely AI uh, driven solution, because I suppose there are kind of some factors at play where 
you know, you, you would have to make quite a strong argument um, for it. But, you know, maybe just to get your take on how scalable do you think it is? And then relatedly, how sustainable is it to really add in that service layer? That human service layer, I should say. Yeah, so right now it's the cost of doing business because if somebody is not doing it, the competitor is going to be using health coaching. So it's something that just needs to be done. Um, how scalable is it? I mean, there's over 150,000, uh, 150 health coaching schools. There's thousands of health coaches being graduated, but it's all about making sure that they're vetted and they're qualified. And these are the coaches that can actually bring outcomes. Um, so it's working with the right partners. It's choosing the right coaches. It's making sure that the protocols are correct. So there's a lot of wheels at play here, right? So that's why the operating system. Yeah, and you know, I, I, again, I, Marina alluded to this earlier. You know, as far as some of the patents, I mean, again, you know, a human being alone also needs help, right? Uh, and that includes coaches. And so, kind of, we're looking at ourselves as you know, helping these coaches to kind of augment them with tech to help them kind of navigate everything from the clientele to improve their own practice. Um, and and so we're. We're absolutely not saying there is use cases around, you know, um, AI coaching, right? And there's many companies that have done everything from diagnostics to then AI coaching. And we will see, yes, yes, and yes, all of this will be needed and all of this will be working together, right? Again, you know, I can go through without mentioning any company names, some kind of diagnostic AI chat chatbot. From there, I can actually get escalated to potentially an AI chatbot coach, right? That can help you through understand certain parameters. At some point, we had this earlier discussion with our director of health coaching operations. You know, it's like That's when you get smiling. on that get on that line, pressing zero to talk to the operator. And screaming operator all yeah. the time because you're so frustrated. And as consumers, we got pretty savvy at knowing when we're talking to even a really smart bot or if we're talking to a real person. Okay. And so are you seeing, I suppose, that that other trend then whereby, you know, companies that may have predominantly betted on AI moving to then that service layer as well, just because, you know, there is such a such a need for it and, and, and probably depends on, on the patient populations in question as well. It's more about surrounding their service. So health coaching is not going to take over their initial offering is still the star of the show. Health coaching just surrounds it to make sure for, to make for better uh, patient client outcomes. Yeah, and just, you know, kind of a random example. And again, won't be mentioned, I, uh, I've known one of the founders for many years. Um, it, you know, the, the whole sort of business plan slash that's at tech, it, it was all about AI. And, you know, again, upstream, it will be asked for help by humans, right? Um, and and it is a more scalable workforce, again, with very different skill sets, right? So we, it's a non-clinical workforce that can be there, um, you know, when, when, when they're needed to help you understand and achieve your goals, right? And refer at the right time as well. I mean, it doesn't come with, without problems, right? right? You're dealing with people, it's human beings on both sides, right? So there's a lot at play here, but is it necessary? I mean, we're betting that, yes, it is. That, that extra layer absolutely is. Absolutely. Um, some digital therapeutics companies have their coaches kind of in-house. What are the benefits of bringing coaches in from the outside? I mean, so there's definitely a benefit to that. And whenever we work with companies, we actually prefer that they have a core operating uh, coaching operations team in-house in order to help build those protocols. Um, to get help from us. I mean, we train the coaches to make sure that they adhere to the company protocols, to make sure that they're part of the company DNA, to make sure that they're the extension of the company. Mm -hmm. So it's, we, we can get them to the company a lot faster, you know, once that figure turns and it's January and everybody, you know, all, the, all those contracts get signed we can be there and we can be ready, you know, hiring and onboarding coaches. It takes months, sometimes up to six months, right? So here's this workforce and they're trained and they're ready and they're ready to help your clients. Okay. Um, again, I think you, you had a, a slide on this in your presentation earlier, but 
talk to us a little bit more about where the supply of coaches is coming from. I think you mentioned, you know, these new courses, all these schools offering uh, coaching programs. Can you expand on that a little bit? Over 150 coaching schools in US alone. And while the certification programs are really fantastic, we love seeing that there's a lot of undergraduate and graduate programs. There's a lot of reshuffling going on. So there's a lot of um, nurses that are going into coaching now. So now there's specific nurse coaching schools that are being set up. There is doctors. There are a lot of functional medicine doctors. There are other doctors that are going into health coaching because they want to understand what their, uh, what their patients are going through because so little is spent in that patient experience when they're going through med school. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of places where coaches are coming from, but it's also about nurturing them. So just because they get a certification, that does not make a great coach. So that's why it's really important what we do because we see what they do actually in the real world. I use this example all the time. There's a coach on a platform with 19 certifications. I have to check, it might be even more at this point. <laughs> Never practiced a day in her life. This is not somebody that we would ever recommend to work with a client of ours, right? So we constantly have to iterate and see what the supply is and to make sure that it's the validated supply. Okay. Um, I'll come back to that point actually, but before I do that, I think it would be nice to just actually clarify about the credentialing and licensing of these coaches. You know, how, how are they vetted and is it easy for them in the US in particular then to operate across state lines? Yeah, so, um, and, and this is, it was interesting that Nikhil in Out of Pocket last night actually mentioned that the digital health companies are adding this talented workforce because uh, pure health and wellness coaching today does not have any state lines, right? And now we do foresee good, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, I actually think would be bad, um, but um, that once the reimbursement codes are coming in, um, there will be more pressure, you know, honestly, for states to collect additional revenue for this workforce, to license and. Now, below that, and what Marina alluded to before, you know, we have our registered nurses that became and gotten their accreditation through the national board or accredited programs. We have registered dietitian, we have nutritionists, we do have fitness instructors that got it. And so, you know, underlying that, matching that to the scope of practice and the need, because there could be a particular need for health and wellness coaches that are also registered dietitian, or certified diabetes uh, educators. And, and so those credentialing already, credentialing already exists. Mm -hmm. We're layering the national board accreditation or certification review, but also as we talked about the real world data um, on, on those coaches you know, and how well they do in real life with their own cohort of patients and clients. Right, and then um, I see a question here from uh, the Q&A. Is your service available outside of the US? And maybe, you know, if you could tag on to that as well, can international coaches practice in the US? How does it work kind of jurisdictionally? So, well, anybody can come on our practice on our platform, practice with their own clients. Being a young startup, we're laser focused on US only. So our clients are US based and the coaches are US based as well. Yeah, and, and today, again, because we're a startup and navigating international laws, so, you know, a coach, you know, somewhere, we actually have one in Mongolia, can practice with their own clients. Um, wherever they are in the world, we're not interfering with their own business. Um, you know, for our B2B client, we would, you know, focus on the U.S. market. Um, I think 93% of our coaches are on the US platform based, are yeah. US based. But interestingly enough, some of their, so we have a coach who is US based, but her whole client base is in Brazil, right? So it's just, it shows how global this is. Okay. And, and state of the state a little bit, just to answer. So while we focus in US, um, you know, UK is probably kind of, I would say right behind on everything from reimbursement. Um, you know, there's a concept of social prescribing. UK Health Coaches Association, we're, you know, pretty close with many associations around the world. Um, we've had some inbound actually just yesterday, you know, can we stand up your coach in Germany and Switzerland? Um, India, Australia. Um, India, Australia. So yeah. there are health coaching associations alive and well, and, and many of them are starting to actually kind of inbound 
um, not only to the national board of health and wellness coaching that has lots of lessons learned, but, but now, you know, to us as well. So, uh, which has been, which, we love. which we've been humbling as, um, for sure. Yeah. D doing well and, and, and lots of potential for expansion. That's great. Um, then going back to something you said earlier, you know, about vetting the coaches that are on your platform and you, you know, you kind of mentioned somebody that, you know, you probably wouldn't fare well on your platform. There's probably a question around, you know, patient trust, kind of establishing that between between the coach uh, and the patient. How can you, with your platform, ensure that patient trust? Talk to me a little bit more about that vetting process that you undertake. So we have algorithms which understand what the coaches say. There is a very specific uh, scope of practice. So if a coach goes outside that scope of practice, if they start prescribing medicine or giving advice. I mean, a health coach, depending on what state they practice in, they're not even able to give nutritional advice in some states. Sometimes they can just say, uh, eat healthy foods. And sometimes they can say, you need to have 200 grams of vegetables at every meal, right? So um, that's the patents that we have are constantly analyzing the conversations that are being had, of course, all the identified data. Um, and that's part of the process. I mean, besides that, when we start working with a client or a B2B client, there's background checks that need to be completed. Um, there is, um, oh my God. We, we go through the whole yeah, onboarding go, process. So tech first, right? The algorithms identify, we knock on the virtual door as mentioned before. We put the, that coach through a process that um, um, Ashley, our director of coaching operations that joined us a few months back. Um, there's a, there's a, like a video interview that's involved. We have to make sure that they can, they're presentable and they can speak to a client and they can present themselves well. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things. I mean, without giving away too much of our secret sauce, right? There's a lot of things that go into it. I mean, it's over a 20 step process that goes into verifying and validating a coach. But, but ultimately, and I, you know, even our, initial algorithms right um the platform or the tech at the end of the day it's about that human to human relationship right and we're going to do our best job you know as a company to do that match there will always be cases where you just don't jive with a person and and that trust is not something a technology can establish it's our human to human connections that establish and for lack of a better term that you know coach to client spark needs to happen as well right and we will learn over time as well what that spark could be potentially but yeah um i have one more question and actually um i think it ties in nicely with some of the questions that are coming through in the chat and so i'll ask mine first and then i'll i'll, I'll add uh, the, the q a questions to that but what types of coaching are you seeing really gain traction so obviously you spoke about mental health being one uh, msk but are there any other kind of unique you know areas where you're really starting to see a need for digital health coaching you know, probably no surprise. Um, you know, it follows the spend of the healthcare system as well, right? So uh, we absolutely, I think, again, you know, diabetes management has been pioneering you know, a lot of the health coaching. Yes, there's a mix of health navigators that's been uh, in assigned, but also, you know, diabetes educators, right? That may or may not have the health coaching accreditation on top of that. Um, you know, um, kind of following that heart health, uh, we're seeing quite a lot, lots in kind of performance uh, management of being kind of the best version of yourself. So this is, you know, outside of the, the chronic disease. Women's health. Women's health has been huge. Uh, across the board. Um, yeah, anywhere from like doulas to like postmenopausal health, right? So it's... Um... Um, recently, much more, which was actually surprising to us, even in kind of the neurodegenerative uh, diseases, right? Um, um, you know, just last two weeks, we've had two inbounds for ADHD um, as well. So these are typically newer company that are being established around this and want to, you know, kind of put coaching around it. Um, we just spoke to a company yesterday that was doing an allergy and asthma coaching um, surrounding that and started with certain programs. Um, so it's really, it's been just fascinating. But again, we want to stress knowledge of that disease is important. There are protocols that need to be put in place, probably more for escalation, referral, et cetera. Health coaching is health coaching is health coaching that understanding of human to human and what that particular patient with that particular disease that whether diagnosed and been managing it 
yes, it's absolutely important, but again, more because of the human to human connection versus the knowledge of the clinical protocols. Because again, this is a non-clinical member of the clinical team in the clinical setting. Okay, um, nice. And uh, there's a few tongue twisters in there, I think, but uh, you mastered them well. Um, so I suppose to tag on to that question then, uh, a question came in from the audience. Does your platform have health coaches with expertise in fall prevention programs, virtual pulmonary rehab programs? And then, you know, if, if you can go through those, um, this person also would like to know, how do you partner with digital health companies who already have a platform? So while we can't say off the bat, um, if we have coaches who specialize in both, I'm sure we do out of 2,300. And if we don't, we know where to get them. We know we know where the coaches hang out for lack of a better word, right? So uh, we have great relationship with a lot of the schools, with the national board um, and for the companies that already have a platform. So we're shipping APIs uh, in July that can be embedded into your own platform. So it's gonna be very native experience for your users. Yeah, so your, your end user will never need to leave your platform. Uh, if you can imagine just the basic chat feature, um, you know, for an end consumer, that chat will go through your platform. You know, we can kind of connect on, on the back end and do uh, integration. For the ones that are just standing something up um, or, or have, you know, lack of flexibility and technical resources, we're also shipping kind of an embeddable widget that allows you to create a user through it in a secure way and then start the discussion scheduling and all of that. And that's why it's so important for the coaches to be practicing on our platform with their own clients because they're so familiar with it and they never leave the Your Coach platform. We, we've been actually compared to something like TruePill uh, for health coaching, right? That ultimately you can leverage our technology stack uh, to embed coaching and yeah. then the human is on the other side, a tech enabled human coach on the other side we've heard it all true pill wheel, wheel steady, steady intel inside yeah so Uber, we've been like yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've heard it all we don't know which ones to put on the slides but you know maybe the audience can vote at some point you can do some maybe testing but um actually the very first question that has come in from the audience was a good one and unfortunately this person has since dropped off but i still think it'd be worth to ask the question um, it's around how do you find these clinical trial opportunities? And this was, you know, when we spoke about um, the particular opportunity for pharma. So why have other companies, you know, that offer coaches not tapped into this yet? Yeah, I, it's, it's a very good question. Um, we don't like to look at what other companies are doing or not doing. Um, we've been very much focused on how we do things. Um, and I think, you know, from a quote unquote USP perspective, we do believe we're one of the largest uh, networks of coaches um, out there um, that are actually on our platform. Um, I think, you know, we bring some of the validity to this, but also, you know, if you think about a health coaching company as a health coaching company, generally, like if you're providing just pure health coaching, you're hiring a number of coaches and you're providing those as a service. Um, I, I think we're, you know, I would say looking way, way, way ahead on, you know, a health coach needs to be kind of embedded in that health journey of the end consumer. And therefore that does require for everything from clinical trials to patient support programs, to virtual care companies, to digital therapeutic companies, um, and to health and wellness, right? If you think about, um, you know, devices that are focused on health and wellness, also wrapping up and adding health coaches to, to the mix of services to help human beings. We're all in need. Nice. Um, I might add, or I might wrap up on, on two questions. So the first one is really, what would be your advice to digital therapeutics uh, companies, you know, thinking about adding this this human coaching layer into their products what would you advise them you know how to go about it besides do it <laughs> yeah no i just you know selfishly of course right um but you know i think part of this is to establish why you're doing this right um you know is it a again a cost of doing business and you're looking at um you know, as a digital therapeutic company, if you're looking at a health coach as somebody to just purely nudge people to use your software, you know, app, platform, et cetera, honestly, there's probably other less expensive and labor force to, to do that. Um, 
so I think always ask the why, why, and, and how does that fit into that patient or end consumer journey and the quote unquote jobs to be done by that individual, right? I, I, that's probably one advice too. While we're getting to the point where we can also kind of consult and help companies to structure the protocols, still, we would highly advise to these companies to get yourself a head coach and, you know, we're happy to also help, right? Our, our network are large enough to work with the leadership team to be part of that, right? Be part of that clinical team, as, you know, in, in a, especially in the prescription digital therapeutic, but also in the non-prescription. Um, I think that's two. Um, and then three, um, I would say, again, from a business model, financial perspective, yes, there's the why for the patient, uh, but also what's the why from a business model and, and how are you going to, you know, help yourself to help other patients? Nice. Um, so, yeah, just just do it, basically. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like the summary, though. Yeah. Um, Great. Well, maybe let's let's end up or let's wrap up on this one. Um, you know, kind of looking into the future, what factors will drive the future demand of coaching, and where do you really see future the future of coaching going? Um, and you can kind of be as aspirational here as you'd like it to be. Outcomes, outcomes, outcomes. That's what it's about. That's what we're tracking. That's what's going to show the future. Even though we can see uh, from our compendium, from the summary of the compendium, um, what has been out there, it's the future outcomes. It's what we're tracking now. Um, reimbursements. I yeah, I mean, that's another one. You know, almost uh, it, it's kind of interesting, a little bit of the parallel uh, while, you know, DTX has been around for, let's call it a decade, a little over a decade plus, and really coming into the light with evidence and some of the initial reimbursements and FDA approvals only in the last few years. In parallel, looking at health coaching again, you know, there's been, it's been around for 20 years, there's been some early studies done. So we're kind of almost like, you know, uh, lo looking at it as two parallel trains. So that would be, I think, the second one, as Marina pointed out, and reimbursements, uh, very similar to the DTX journey. Um, and then health coach being a part of the health and care team. You know, it's already been recognized, uh, the profession as the part of the healthcare team now, um, Let's hope that the teams welcome the health the health coach as part of their team. You know, the the one quick comment that I would make is, you know, we're we're having as an industry, as DTX industry, challenges in adoption, and this is that trust by the doctor into the technology. Um, I would almost say, and if you actually think through, you know, your earlier question a bit, and it just kind of came to light, is humans trust humans more. I would say in many cases, and so. <laughs> doctors may be more likely to trust that coach versus a digital therapeutic. So maybe that's another route to market. I just throwing it out there. It <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I literally just thought about this now. So um, We'll have a follow-up webinar on that. Um, yeah. we're, we're, we're almost up on time. So I guess any, any last words from, from both of you before we wrap up? The future is bright of health and wellness coaching. We're really excited to be here for the ride and uh, just happy to answer any questions anybody has. We're happy to continue the series and demystifying. I know we only touched upon a few things. I see there's a lot more questions. So just reach out to us and we're happy to, to keep the conversation going. And, and we're super open. Whatever use case you can come up with, we really want to get our arms around. So again, we can help you as as you know somebody who is listening to this to help the ultimately the consumer and the patient and then the coaches that are uh, just eager to jump to help people it's a it's an interesting breed of individuals we're all in a journey we just want to make more healthy and happy humans so that's what we're here for however we get there lovely um well on that note thank you both uh, very very much this was a great conversation um I know you said you're happy for people to reach out to you. Uh, we'll make the slides available to Health Excel members. Um, but yeah, with that, I'll leave you and I'll thank you again. Thank you, Tess.